Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. Um, listeners, I got to tell you, this is a very, very special episode uh, that you are listening to right now. As many of our devoted listeners know, we've been trying to get the one, the only Frank D'Angelo on our show. Uh, we've called it a saga, as a matter of fact. And uh, before we get into that, I'm here with my friend and trusted producer, as always, Max Kerman. Yes, hey. And I'm here with the man who made this all happen, the man that was obsessed, the man that started the saga, Shane Cunningham. Well, do we want to bury the lead that we've got him in as an interview? <laughs> or do we want to keep that as a mystery? I, I think it's a I, I actually description. don't even know the answer. Yeah. Oh, you don't know. I don't know what's happened. So I'm going in totally fresh. But before we get to it, Mike, can you set up who Frank D'Angelo is? Because so, we have some uh, you know, newer listeners who weren't in on the saga. You know, Because we, we haven't really talked about it in the last few weeks. Who is Frank? Who's Frank D'Angelo? If you're listening, you probably know who he is. <laughs> but if you're one of the few that don't, let us set it up. He is a Canadian uh, food and drink magnet. He uh, is a very wealthy man. Um, that's his business. But on the side, he's a massive cinephile. He's a director. He's a writer, producer. And so he makes these, uh, these films. He shoots them in like, what, a week or two? He's also a singer who, who scores all the music to his films and has, uh, I believe he's had 13 albums to date. He's made his fortune in apple juice. Apple juice. And he also has owned restaurants. He, as you say, he's a food, food guy. He's got more albums than you, Max. I know. And he uses uh, some of his money to create films. He's made six films in the last four years. And his big thing is he brings in uh, big time names, uh, Hollywood actors that have been nominated for Oscars, recognized in their field. Uh, give us some of the names, Shaney Boy. Uh, James Kahn. Big name. Paul Sorvino. Martin Landau, another Oscar winner. One of the Baldwin brothers. Daniel Baldwin. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> Frank is a very interesting and fascinating guy, and a lot of people have, that have listened to us have been very interested to see where this saga is what we call it, is going. And uh, we've had recent developments in this saga, and I think Shane, uh, because it's a very special Frank D'Angelo episode, we're going to kind of let you just take it away and set it up. Okay, so I don't like when anything in life just you, you're after it and it just ends up being a dead end. With this one, I was like, it's going to take a few years before we're able to get Frank. <laughs> because we, we had an interview lined up. You went to his restaurant in Mississauga. You, you took the afternoon off work. That's we took correct. the entire day off work. Yeah. And he didn't show up. He we took a another, vacation day. Yeah. And he, what happened was Frank had listened to an episode where I was talking about how I went to his movie premiere. And Frank thought I was uh, disparaging his, his film premiere, basically saying that it was, there was kind of an awkward silence in it. We actually do end up addressing this later on. But long and short of it was Frank was kind of messing with us a little bit in the sense that he, <laughs> he would say for sure there was going to be an interview. And then the next day something would come up last second and there wouldn't be an interview anymore. And I, I wasn't sure if he was just messing around or if something was actually coming up. Months and months go by. I was kind of resigned to the fact that this just wasn't going to happen. But I was secretly biding our time till we were popular enough. <laughs> till and, and, and award nominated. Till it would actually be impressive to Frank. Because Frank works with heavy hitters in Hollywood. I think once he realized that although the podcast is called Mike on Much, it's not on television. Like he, at first when I called him, he thought it was going to be on much music, like the TV, the TV station. station Frank was very excited. I think he did a little digging and realized we're just a podcast. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. So we were recently nominated for an MMVA. So that gives us a little juice. Yep. So I've been letting that marinate a little bit. <laughs> and someone messaged me the other day, my, my good friend Khan, And he said, so is the Frank D'Angelo thing just dead? Just out of the blue. Uh -huh. So I'm like, huh. I just compose an email to send to Frank immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, hello there. Would just like to reach out to see if Frank would be interested in being interviewed to promote his new film. I have Frank's assistant CC'd on this with Frank and his other associate. I say, our latest director interview was with Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead, Scott Pilgrim, Baby Driver. I like that move. If you're like, come on, we got Edgar Wright on the show and you're going to say no. Okay. I, so I say. <laughs> that sounded condescending, but you know what I mean. So yeah. I say, which you can check out on this link. And then I, I give a link to the, their previous podcast episode. I go, our podcast is also nominated for an MMVA this year, and we will be interviewing celebrities during the telecast. So please let us know if you would prefer to be interviewed during the MMVA night. Thanks. I don't think anything of it. Seconds later, my phone begins to ring. Oh, unknown name, unknown number. Answer. Hello. <laughs> Frank here. <laughs> like, hi, Sh Shane Cunningham. Uh, Frank, great to hear from you. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you want to you do an interview, eh? 
Okay. Yeah, let's go. I'm like, yeah, when? when? He's like, now. I'm good now. <laughs> so so I'm like, Frank, um, you know, we, we have a host of the show. We have audio equipment we need to set up. It's going to take a little time. He's like, okay. Uh, well, when's good for you? I go, when's good for me? Frank, you're much busier than I. When's good for you? Tomorrow, 10 a.m. All right, ciao. <laughs> Hangs up. <laughs> So I've got a uh, a phone interview on my hands. Like, he he wouldn't show up, right? He wanted to do it over the phone? Sure. Although he had blown me off previously, I think for sure it's going to happen the next day. Although, you know, Mike is like, I don't know. I've heard that before, and a lot of people are saying that. <laughs> I'm all excited. I call Frank the next morning at 10 a.m. sharp. Should we just play the recording? Let's, what play happened? Let's okay. do it. Like a proper podcast. Here we go. This is a recording of Frank calling you back to do the interview that morning. It's like cereal. Hello. Hello, Frank. This is uh, Shane Cunningham calling. How are you, Shane? Good. How are you Shane. doing? Good, bud. Uh, buddy, I, I, um, I know I told you to call me this morning, but can can we uh, do it tomorrow morning? I just got so much work. Are you, do you want to come to the movie tonight? Oh, I'd love to. Yes. Okay, so at five o'clock, I'll put you on the get, uh, VIP thing. Come, come um, to forget about it at five o'clock. Okay. Okay. So, and you can meet everybody. Everybody's here: Bert Young, Danny Baldwin, Giancarlo Giannini, Franco Nero. Everybody's here. Would I be able to bring my wife by any chance? Absolutely done. It'll be under Cunningham. Cunningham. Perfect. Is it spelled like Richie Cunningham from Happy Days? Exactly. Yes. So, Mr. and Mrs. Cunningham. Okay. Perfect. I'll see. I'll see you there. Okay, brother. Oh, thanks so much. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. So clearly, Frank has now blown off the interview <laughs> yet again, and he's invited me though to his premiere of his new film called The Neighborhood. So I'm very excited. So after that call, call my wife. Hey. Hey, hey. How, how did it go? Well, he... <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Just out of nowhere, he's like, you want to come to the movie tonight? <gasps> What'd you say, obviously? I said, yeah. So I have to meet him <laughs> at Forget About It Supper Club at five so i asked if i could bring you and he said mm -hmm. he said yes but you have to be there at five and Al, uh daniel baldwin's gonna be there and all the actors oh my god this is insane bring my dress shoes and high-powered deodorant oh my god i'm so excited babe what i love you i love you too bye bye all right bye okay so obviously she was very excited, <laughs> and I've clearly revealed I have a BO problem when I'm very excited because I asked her for this high-powered deodorant I use when there's a big event. <laughs> told her to grab that. When he's around high-powered players, he wears <laughs> high-powered deodorant. So I, I go in. I see Frank briefly. He didn't really want to talk to me too much. Did you have to introduce yourself? Did you know who, who you were? Kind of, but Frank, before a show, he's pretty... Manic, I guess, is the word. Like, he's got so much stuff to think about. He's like, hey, hi, hi, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm like Shane Cunningham. I don't even think he registers who sure. I am. And he's just telling everyone, 6.15, we got to be out of here. We got to be out of here. That's when the movie starts. Then, movie starts, watch the film. And I must say, uh, it was his best film to date, definitely. Nice. I'm not sure if any of our listeners have seen any of his films, but they're interesting. You know, there's a, there's a... He shoots an entire feature film in, in six days, which is pretty much unheard of. Can you give us a premise of what The Neighborhood's about? Yeah, The Neighborhood is about a bunch of thieves. Nice. They accidentally steal a mob boss's money. And they stole it from the wrong guy. They, they stole money from the wrong guy. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that's all I'll say from there. Okay, don't spoil it. Go see it. And Frank hired the police to be there also. The band? No, uh, <laughs> no, yeah, it is loaded. The, the actual uh, police were there to, to do security. Frank, at one point, he gives a cop 30 bucks. He's like, here, take this. And the cop's like, what? what? Why are you giving me $30? <laughs> He's like, hey, you're going to buy popcorn and some drinks for Danny A Aiello. Aiello. <laughs> Aiello. He's an Oscar nominated actor. Also, the cop's like, okay, cop has no idea who Danny Aiello is. <laughs> <laughs> he's just buying him popcorn, a drink, and snacks. <laughs> and the cop has to walk out with no clue and do this weird delivery of these snacks. <laughs> it's, it's, 
we're like, why are you doing that? He's like, I don't know. Frank hired me. I got, I got to do what he says. <laughs> anyway, we're at the after party and it's just basically it's a lot of men, a lot of older men. Frank is friends with a lot of older actors. It was kind of mind blowing. We're seeing all the people that we've been watching in all of these Frank films. Like we watched Sicilian Vampire, one of Frank's funnier films, the day before we knew we were going to see this premiere too. And all the actors from that movie are at the premiere to this movie because Frank uses a cast of characters who appear in all of his movies. But at the after party, all these men are kind of, they've had a little bit to drink. Frank had an open bar. So they're getting a little bit ravenous towards Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all swarming oh, no. in on her. They basically just like are laughing at the fact that I'm married to Alex. Like they, they think it's hilarious that a guy like me is married to this babe. Like they're like, man, she's so out of your league. And all of them are just so drunk. They do not care about my feelings at all. And there's this guy. He's an English guy. He's exactly like Austin Powers. Literally says, yeah, baby. Every other word. Not trying to copy Austin That's Powers. Funny. That's just part of the way he talks. Did Alex make him horny? It's funny you ask because <laughs> Alex actually did make him horny. <laughs> <laughs> that was the worst impression, yeah. by the way, of us. It wasn't even a British Do accent. I make you horny? There it is. is. Yeah, that was better so, than mine. So then he's like, he goes, I'm, I'm a married man, but I would totally bang you. <laughs> he says it to Alex right in front of me. <laughs> so then I'm like, am I going to get the interview with Frank? So I'm building up the courage at the after party to talk to him. So Frank is talking to all these super high up bigwigs. Finally, there's a brief moment where Frank's walking by and I have to go. So this is my last chance to arrange an interview. I say, Hey Frank, he goes, Hey, how, how you doing? I go, Shane Cunningham. I'm from uh, much music. Actually. He's like, Oh, Hey, did you like the movie? I go, I loved the movie. So is that interview happening tomorrow? And then he's like, well, you, you like the movie? I was like, yeah. He's like, give me a call tomorrow. Oh, so this is the interview without further ado. Here is an hour and 15 minute long interview. <laughs> <laughs> that I you, you know, Shane, this is the first time on the Micah Much podcast where I am not doing the interview. Yeah, and I say an hour and 15, but I'm assuming this is going to be cut down by maybe 25 minutes or so. But Frank was very generous with his time. Without further ado, uh, unless you guys have any more questions. I think we just got to get this thing. I'm, I'm excited yeah. for it. We haven't heard it yet. So let's do it. The saga is over. Nothing. Hello. Frank, this is uh, Shane yes. calling. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. You wouldn't happen to have time for uh, an interview right now, would you? Yeah, we'll do it right now. Perfect. Okay, so this is about six months in the making, so I'm excited to talk to you. In your career, you have been a brewmaster. Well, I've never been a brewmaster, but I, I, I was in the beer business. I right. Know. We had a blue master. You're also in the energy drink business, the water business. You're a singer. You're an actor. You're a director. You're a writer. You're a producer. What do you consider the most fulfilling, and what do you consider the least fulfilling out of those? Well, my longest career has been singing. I've been doing that all my life. I made a living at it. The music is, is the catalyst for everything that I'm doing in the entertainment business. I mean, uh, we have, ten, I think, 10 or 11 albums out, and... And um, we have almost seven movies, and it's all based on music. I write the music, and that's where the story evolves from. How do you find the time to do so many things? I'm always fascinated that about you because you've made, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've made six films in the last four years. And if you keep going at this rate, you're literally going to be more prolific than Woody Allen. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'll ever be more prolific than Woody Allen. He's a genius. When I say prolific, I just mean in terms of the output he does, it's, it's unbelievable. Until you, I've never actually seen anyone who can actually do a film a year or more than a film a year in some cases. So I'm wondering, is he one of your inspirations in terms of just sheer output or is there another? Well, I, I mean, I don't mind Woody Allen movies. I mean, I think he's a, a brilliant man, but that's, it's not my genre. Uh, guys, uh, people that really baffle me and, and how they make a, a film that's Francis Ford Coppola and Scorsese did. Their attention to detail is crazy. I'm not racing to be the guy who makes the most movies in a year. I'm, you know, I'm a type of guy that if I'm going to do something, I start it and I finish it. 
whether I've had success or failure. I've never in my life not finished what I've started. And for people who don't know, you'll shoot an entire feature film in six days. Six six days. Yeah, we shot the the neighborhood in six days. Some some movies have taken eight nine days, but we sh- we shot the neighborhood in six days. But you know, if we do a lot of planning, and and I don't understand. Maybe I'm wrong, and, and I'm missing something. Hollywood shoots a page in one day, and I don't. I shoot 30, 40 pages in a day. We use eight cameras. We use two jibs. We use drones. We, we, we get maximum coverage of a specific scene so we don't have to stop, tear it down, and, and, and do it all over again because we only have a two-shot. Where did you develop that style from? Was that just your idea? Well, it was my idea because it doesn't take much to make me bored and I can't stand still so to to pick out to do to have a one or two cameras and and then you got to do the close-up and then you got to do the far shot and then you got to do the 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 wide shot and then you got to do the overhead shot and I I don't have the patience for that Mm -hmm. plus the cameras that like we we shot on Sony red 8k's in this film like it's not it's another five seven years away so you have to dumb down the 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 the, uh, resolution as I'm sure you know. To be honest, when I uh, I direct commercials for a living, but I'm not the most technical guy in the world. So I kind of rely on my crew to carry me a little bit, especially my uh, DP. Are you the same way or are you a big uh, tech head? I'm a tech head. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big freak. I love technology. I, I read up on everything, whether it's cell phones and smartphones and computers. I'm, um, you know, I'm, uh, I know just as much in our business uh, as our IT guys, if not more. I'm involved in every aspect, and I'm the guy who edits. I got guys to put the film together in edit suites, but I'm the guy who cuts the movie. I was reading your uh, biography. In that, you talk about one day writing a musical. Was that in jest, or is that still something that you're interested in? No, no. I mean, I mean you asked the question last night, and, and I, yeah, I'm, I actually wrote a musical, and I just, you know, a little shy about it, but, uh, you know, with that. Live stage is great. I mean, I love live performance. It's it's the biggest thing for me. I'm performing live tonight at the at the at the gala where they're, they're, they're handing out awards at the Ritz tonight for the ICFF, which is this unbelievable film festival. I've been to many film festivals, but the ICFF is just it's sick. You actually won a best film uh, at that that film festival. Yeah, That's for uh, for uh, Real Gangsters uh, with uh, the great uh, legendary Robert Loja. That was your first film. So my first film, we did it on a lark. You know, we had the Being Frank show, and then we, uh, I think it was two years into the Being Frank show, I wrote a little script, and um, I met uh, Michael Pere and uh, got a chance to meet Robert Lodge, and I, I showed them that, and they go, well, when do you want to do it? I go, well, do you, if you like it, we'll do it next week. And we shot it in three days. Robert Loggia is from, for people who don't know, is from the movie Scarface. Yes, but with Robert Loggia, Scarface, he was great, but... Robert Loggia, you know, was nominated for an Oscar for Jagged Edge. Mm-hmm. Robert Loggia was absolutely brilliant and big. Robert Loggia is probably one of the most incredible underrated actors in the world. When you're acting in a, your first feature film, this is the first thing you've ever directed, first thing you've written. Are you nervous acting alongside someone who's that accomplished? No, I don't have time to be nervous. I'm, I'm so engulfed and enthralled in what I'm doing. I really don't have time. It's like, you know, where you drive home and you pull in the driveway and you don't know how you got there? Yeah, because you're just, yeah. your mind's racing and you're thinking of everything. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, I'm kind of the same way, actually. Speaking of which, I heard, maybe this was actually from you in your book, that you only sleep two to three hours a night. Is that true yeah. or an exaggeration? If I have to sleep three hours, that's a big night. Uh, you, I saw you last night and I hadn't slept in 36 hours. Are you running on your energy drinks, coffee? Like, what is your fuel? I can't do caffeine, dude. And we, our energy drinks don't have caffeine. I can't do any of that. It, I can't. I don't drink coffee. It, it would make me nuts. So, so you just have this natural adrenaline always pumping through your veins. And you're you're the same way. You know, I don't know you very well, but I spoke to you a few times, and I met you last night. So, you know, you're driven, so you you want to accomplish stuff. So I. I I think that people who are driven, it, it, it cre- they create the energy that's necessary to finish the task. Very true, very true. So in, in your films, you've played a homeless man in The Big Fat Stone. You played a gangster. One of my favorite movies. Favorite movies. Mine as well. So you played a homeless man, a gangster in Real Gangsters. You played an RCMP officer in The Red Maple Leaf. 
a vampire. No, I played a cop. I wasn't an Oh, guy. right. Yes. And you played a vampire, of course, in Sicilian Vampire. Yeah, I didn't go full vampire. Oh, you know. But, yeah, you yeah. Were, you were half vampire, uh, half human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in No Deposit, uh, you were uh, an, a bank executive? No Deposit, no. I was a wealthy guy. Right. Uh, I, I, that's another cool little movie that I love. Out of all these people you've played, jobs aside that these characters have, which character would you say is most close to you, like in your, your real personality? I, uh, that's a great question, actually. There's a, I'd say there's a lot of Eddie Rizzo in me. Um, so Eddie Rizzo, just uh, to give the audience context, he's from uh, Big Fat Stone, and he's a, a homeless man who's extremely vulnerable, and he's very kind to everyone he comes in contact with. That's that's one way to look at it, and you're you're very perceptive. But I think Eddie Rizzo's soul was so benign that there was no maliciousness in it. And so I guess I guess when people have absolutely nothing, something is everything. Right. And and I I just think that uh, for me, I I I busted my ass. I started my business out of a truck. I I spent uh, four years. Oh, you can bleep that out. I, I, I spent, oh, that's fine. This is uh, a podcast. Swear away, baby. Uh, I, I don't do good to this uh, swearing, but oh, we'll it does be slip up. Okay. <laughs> um, I um I spent four or five treacherous years on the road playing in a band. I've written maybe two hundred songs. You know, some decent, some shit. Your band and, was called um, uh, Toronto, correct? We were a band Toronto. There was two bands Toronto, but when we were Toronto, we were the only Toronto. And then a rock band uh, came, very talented rock band. And they came out and they had a hit song right away. We had the name first, but uh, we were, I bowed out. <clears throat> you know, so there was no animosity. So do you think they were a better band than you or they just were more established? Well, and kind I, of pushed I, I wouldn't say they were a better band, but they were a different genre. We were an R&B band and I always had a big band. They were way more successful than us. Thing, and I didn't want to step in front of their uh, success or right. jump on their bandwagon. I was actually trying to look for some of your early work when you were in Toronto. But since Toronto is such a generic title and there's so many Google searches related to Toronto, I couldn't find it. Is it that available anywhere for the fans listening? Uh, well, you know, I had a, I had a, a song that did... Decent in uh, in the eighties. What was that song called? Um, where the wind where the wind becomes a song. Where the wind becomes a song, which was written uh, not by me. It was written by a very very dear friend of mine, Arnie Wiskin, who was very talented, and he's no longer with us. Speaking of music, you do the soundtrack for all of your movies. Yes. Do you write? all the original songs specifically for the film or is your back catalog just so extensive that you just no, uh, no. pick? No, I read all the songs for the movie. Uh, the music you heard yesterday, I wrote that in one night, all of it. Wow. And, um, and, and the way I do it is very unorthodox. I uh, go in the studio and we have nothing, zero. And um, I, I, I come up with a melody. We lay down the bed track. So I'll come up with seven, eight melodies We'll do seven, eight bed tracks in one night, and then I'll go in the booth and uh, bullshit my way through uh, with uh, whatever words come out of my mouth. Jay-Z works in a very similar fashion where he will just not have anything on the written page and just come in and spit out some fire, basically. I'm wondering, is he one of your inspirations? I'm not very familiar with his stuff. I'm an R&B guy. Mm -hmm. I like to be natural. That's why I start from zero. And I don't plan the, the music. You don't plan when we're going to talk to your wife. Well, sometimes when I'm in trouble, I have to write some things out, uh, which has happened to me on this podcast, actually, with a recent press release. Well, I think you're pretty. I think you're pretty bright, and I think you you're pretty quick. <laughs> so you're pretty spontaneous, and that's why you're in the business that you're in. You're right. Speaking of seeing you live, I was actually trying to get on your show in the last couple months but i guess you've been busy with films and everything um and you want you wanted to get on my show I'm, well, I'm sorry i didn't understand yeah sorry you have a you have a talk show a late night talk show called being frank yeah being and, frank is it is seven season and we're, we're uh, about to uh make a, a deal with a major network in the united states but i'd love to have you on the show and and in the fall uh, you come on and uh, we'd love to have you we're, we're really proud of the show proud of our, our numbers no, no Canadian late night show has ever done those numbers. We're the longest running late night show. And, and you, now we're going into season eight. And we also have a, another producer of this podcast. His name is Max Kerman. He's a lead singer of the band, the Arkells. Not sure if you know them, but he was very interested in appearing 
as a guest and maybe singing a song on your show. Absolutely, we'd love to have him. Does he? Does he have his band that travels with him, or because we have a fourteen piece? house band on on the show he does have a band but he sang with an orchestra before he's he's very open okay, so we, we, we would love to have him i think uh, it'd be great i mean i've been very blessed i interviewed paul newman i interviewed tony bennett i interviewed the great al pacino the only interview he ever gave to canada very hard guy to interview is al pacino going to be in the next film i don't want to uh, ruin any I, I will not comment right now i will take executive privilege all right. Okay. Well, that's exciting, uh, regardless whether that happens or not. Just just having the rumor swirling sometimes is enough. Uh, but back to your talk show. You're the only talk show I've ever seen in my entire life where the host openly swears. Uh, was this decision made to stand out by being risque? Like, no, 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 no. That's just no. organic. That's, that's, just, that's just who I am. Right. And, and unfortunately, the sensor bu- buzzer uh, buzzes over and over, but you know, you, you know, on uh, two and a half men on prime time, they talk balls. Mm-hmm. But that's that's who I am, and and I do not want to be somebody else when I'm doing my show. What is your favorite swear word? There isn't any. It's just you know. I mean, when we grew up, every second word would fuck you. I like mother for myself for some reason. Yeah, mother is a good one. When we grew up, uh, our favorite was sucker. But what are you gonna do? Yeah. Tucker's my second favorite, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think it, it's a it's a very broad term. It's, it's all in how you say. Uh, it. Yeah, you can use it as affection. You <laughs> fucking <laughs> sucker. That's affectionate. Exactly. But if you say, "Listen, you fucking sucker," that's a little different. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, what does a typical day look like? Well, there's no typical day, but I'm I'm up every day at five. Um, take the dog for a walk, and he tells me to off sometimes because he likes to sleep in. <laughs> I do all my bank recs. We're, our plant's open 24 hours a day. You should come and see our plant. We're state-of-the-art. We produce 50,000 cases of product a day. We employ almost 200 people. Wow. Um, I started the business out of a truck uh, when I was a kid and um, proud of it. Um, it's very hard, though, to be uh, in manufacturing in Ontario. We have uh, very strict environmental laws, which is good. I love it. I'm a, I'm a tree hugger. I, I believe in the f-ing climate uh, mess that uh, uh, bastards, scumbags uh, who uh, have no clue. <clears throat> it's like the piece of shit that drives down the highway and throws his garbage out. They're f-ing suckers. Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, now that's a f-ing <laughs> Yeah. So my day is... Uh, and I go, and I go, and I go, and I go, and then I, what I like to do at, at the end, whether it's 12, 1, 2 in the morning, I like to get a recap, uh, whether I watch uh, CNBC, CNN. Um, you know, Fox News is way too conspiracy-oriented for me. Speaking of press, if you ever see a review or something of your film that's negative in nature, how do you handle criticism, or do you not even read it? I'm going to be straight up with you, okay? And you ask me something, and I I told you the last time when I spoke to you, I'll always be straight with you as long as you're respectful. uh, Absolutely. We had a piece of shit, a f***ing low life. Um, There's a guy here who's been stalking me, uh, which is Will Sloan. And so they sent this f***ing douchebag. What do they call these guys? Uh, Paparazzi? Contract writers. Okay. Right, freelance. Yeah. They're freelancers, correct. That's the word I was looking for. So uh, um, we we had our uh, movie Sicilian Vampire in a film festival in New York. And the theater, it was f***ing jammed. And this guy came in, cut up the movie, said there was nobody there, full of shit. So mm-hmm. that makes me nuts. Right. That will make me fucking nuts. Mm-hmm. For me, a film critic should talk about his expertise if he got it. Not go personal on the director. It's the movie. It has nothing to do with the, the personal side. So, But you know, I, criticism, I guess, hurts everybody. I guess what you're saying is you don't mind it as long as it's respectful and a lot of people uh, go below the belt. I really don't mind. I know there's and haters and there's there's losers who have nothing better to do if i hear if i don't like a restaurant i don't keep f-ing harping and going back to that same restaurant and then keep saying how shit it is if i don't like a, a, an entertainer or an actor i don't stalk them and, and and talk shit and just keep stalking them I, I don't understand that you know next question you tend to work with a cast of the same actors over and over again uh armand asanti margot kidder has been in almost every film michael pare Etc. Is there any actor you've worked with who you wouldn't work with again? Not really. I've been very blessed. I mean, some guys are more quirky than others, and I'm pretty f***ed up, and I, I want things my way, but I'm not the guy who started that. Scorsese works with the same guys. Michael Prey, 
to me, is one of the most underrated actors in the world. He's f***ing brilliant. And I think he's, I think he's spectacular in the neighborhood. Oh, absolutely. And he got his break in Eddie and the Cruisers, correct? And then That's correct. And then he became a, a superstar overnight. And then he did Streets of Fire. He did the Philadelphia Experiment. He became a, a superstar overnight. He's been in every single one of your films. And he's f***ing amazing. Why would I put him in every movie? So he's kind of like your Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, if we're comparing Scorsese to, to your films. No, he's just a guy that, like, that role that you saw him in last night, I wrote that part for him. Right. Specifically for him. And I wrote that part for Danny, because Danny Baldwin is very bombastic. Uh, bombastic. He's very loud. And uh, he's a sarcastic prick, and I love him. And uh, <laughs> You talk about Daniel Baldwin. I've had the pleasure of hanging out with him briefly, at, actually, at the Red Maple Leaf premiere in, that you had in Hamilton. His personality seems, like you're saying, very loud and outspoken. Does that ever clash with you being the director? Like, do you ever have many mm. arguments on set with a guy like no, that? No, never, because Danny is a, a professional. He's been doing this a million f***ing times. I think he's been in 200 feature films, and, and he knows his place when he's on the set. And I had a beef with you on what, what you said about the Red Maple Leaf. That f***ing theater was jammed. That, that little film festival, which is a cute little film festival in Hamilton, I love the guy mm -hmm. who runs it. He's so cool. Um, he has never had an audience like that. They turned away people. They turned away like 80, 90 people. I remember that. But like you, you were saying... But you that, said yeah. that it wasn't full. You said that it wasn't full. And you said that there was an uncomfortable silence. Now we have... It because we taped it, with, mm -hmm. with seven, eight cameras, the people went f***ing nuts over the, the Red Maple Leaf. See, you have video proof. So sometimes, and I get accused of this a lot, the perception not being in line with reality. I, I, was, I was surprised. I was surprised by you saying that because I like you. And I did not expect that from you. But I, I felt that uh, that, that uh, show, I was very proud. Uh, I love Hamilton. Yeah, I'm, I, I live I mean, there, yeah. I, I, I love Hamilton. You know, now it's unfortunate for Hamilton that people f finally woke up and say, holy f Hamilton is only 37 minutes from Toronto. Yeah. Well, my commute's an hour and a half every morning because the, the effing traffic, but... Well, why, why, don't, why wouldn't you take the... Isn't there a go train there? Yeah. The, the only problem is I find it uh, hard to sleep on a train with someone facing me, and the go bus is so much more comfortable. So I, I take the go bus, even though I do lose some time there. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I love Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of my... A lot of ha a lot of people from Hamilton came last night to that movie. I saw, yes. And there's no denying, although I did, uh, I guess I accidentally, which I did apologize for, uh, exaggerate the awkward silence. Last night yeah, was but, a full but, but But, but the, the people went nuts, and people mm -hmm. laughed at every joke. Uh, everybody um, laughed at the, the, the right time, and, and, and I found it a very perceptive audience. And mm -hmm. in that audience, we only had 22 people of our people in there. The rest right. were people, like, right. you know, regular uh, people who came in. And that's a magnificent theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it I was, was not happy. Great. I was uh, I was not happy that they played a Blu-ray because a Blu-ray does not uh, accentuate the f money and the labor that we put in. You got to put a DCP. So you weren't happy with the uh, quality on the screen. You thought there was degradation. There's massive degradation when, when you're when you're playing it on a Blu-ray player, unless they're using a $10,000 Blu-ray player, which I'm sure they were not. But I thought, I thought honestly, that this movie, for some reason, it just looked even better than all of your other films. And the editing, I thought, was just tighter, too, for some reason. Well, you're, 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 well, all my editing is tight, but this time I really went from the beginning, right from the beginning, from when we dumped uh, the footage of, from the cameras into uh, the computer, to doing a rough cut, it's like f***ing renting a car. You might have a decent person who rents a car, but you don't give a f*** if he goes over a bump. It's not yep. a car. Very, very so. true. Frank, what is the biggest misconception about you? I don't know. I'm a, a guy that says what's on my mind. So some, some people can see it one way, some people can see it another way. I really don't give a shit about the people that see it the other way. Uh, when you have a career like yours, you're going to go through a lot of adversity. The worst adversity in my life, in the history of my life, uh, is twofold. One, my father having a major stroke last November, and we survived it, and he's good, he's fine, but it was a, a really f dark time in my life. And the second one, and I'm not going to go into detail, uh, the brewery. Uh, the brewery was the love of my life. We were very successful. 
Uh, it was the fastest growing beer in Canada in the, in the history of the uh, beer business. And things came to a grinding halt. And that was extremely disappointing to me in my life. Shit happens and you move on. Do you think you're a stronger person for have uh, gone through something like that? No disrespect here. I, I hate that f***ing term. Nothing makes you stronger. You you have two f***ing choices. You either play the victim and bitch and complain and, and, and go backwards, or you say, f*** it, you know? Right. Throw that shit in the garbage or recycle bin and, get, and move on. F*** it. So your advice to people would be throw it in the recycle bin and move on with your life and don't dwell on it. I, I, anybody that has a bad point in their life, this makes you stronger is bullshit. If you're watching TV and the f***ing station shit, go to another station. Change Watch the f***ing TV off. Right. Don't complain, well, man, this show is f***ing shit, man. I'm a Netflix man myself, and I do the same. If I'm not liking a movie, I just switch it midway through. I don't I don't waste my time watching a film I don't like. I'm addicted to Apple. What, what uh, show does Frank D'Angelo watch? I'm a big fan of the Big Bang Theory. I'm a big fan of the uh, Goldbergs. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Family Guy. I think it's hysterical. Uh, one of my favorite lines in uh, your film is in Sicilian Vampire, where you show up at a club where your daughter's being sexually harassed, and you just kill all these guys. And your daughter asks, how did you know I was in trouble? And you say, honey, I could hear a mouse fart. Later on in the film, there's literally a mouse walking by and the mouse lets out a fart. And then you wake up from your sleep. And I thought that was very funny. And I suspected that you had maybe had an interest in comedy. I love comedy. I think, uh, I think comedy is uh, the fundamental foundation of every day that it exists. Like if, if my movies are serious... There's always some comedy in there. There's a great opening line in the Red Maple Leaf. You know, when I asked Tony Nardi if I could take a sh uh, an Italian shower, right? So, right, right. There's there's drama in every comedy. I mean, there's drama in the Big Bang Theory. There's drama in Modern Family. There's drama in the Goldbergs. And a lot of people say some of the best comedy is in dramatic films. Oh, you're 100 percent correct. Look at Goodfellas. Was Goodfellas a f comedy? And same with uh, Casino. I found very funny also with Joe Pesci's character. And Raging Bull. Uh, you know, another uh, brilliant movie that Scorsese. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Funny thing, especially when Robert De Niro's going to Joe Pesci. Did you fuck my wife? Did you fuck my wife? I felt <laughs> people were trying to, f not to get off topic, trying to f my wife at your party last night. <laughs> a lot of your buddies were all over her, man. Well, your wife's a pretty lady, and, uh, you know, they're, they're not my buddies. There's a lot of people there. And, <laughs> and you know, some of the movie stars, uh, they get a little uh, vino in them, and they, yeah. they become completely, I don't think they tried to f your wife but they tried to flirt with her but you have a beautiful wife well, one of the guys said hey i'm married but i would bang you he said that right to my wife it was it was a funny line and we all laughed but uh, well, I, uh you're you're then you're a better man than me because if somebody would have said that to uh, a woman that i was with uh he would be seeing the dentist that night well if you if you watch any of your movies too you're always beating the shit out of guys in your films. And I think I'm in real life a bit of a wimp, so people can kind of sense that. So. Well, I, I don't think you're a wimp. I think that you're much more pragmatic than I am. I'm, I fly off the handle. But if somebody, if I was there beside you and somebody would have said that with me there, uh, it would not have been a good night for them. Right. I would have ripped his <laughs> and eyebrows off. Um, I just want to talk lines. In, in your movies, you have a lot of memorable lines. In Sicilian Vampire, you say life is timing, timing is life. In uh, the Red Maple Leaf, I believe you say it's nice to be great, but it's great to be nice. And my favorite line is in the Big Fat Stone, you say, where Art Hindle says, I sold my brother out for pussy, and you've been nothing but a yeah, I gave him that line right there and then because it came to me in that moment and I said to Alan Dubin, who I love, another great actor, your character is a real bitch and I just want him to finally realize who the real family is, not the bitch drinking and smoking on the couch, right? Alan, do you have a, f a problem? She said no. So, you know, it's a strong line. It's a little mm -hmm. racy, you know, anytime you use the C word, right? Yep. But uh, but every every theater that we, we had that movie playing and in every film festival and they cheered Art Handel. Cheered yes. him. That wasn't on the written page. Eighty percent of what you hear in my movies is not on the written page. So all the guys who've been with me already in a couple of movies, they know that that's gonna happen. And do you find they like that or are they a little scared of the unknown? I I've never experienced that. All my all the people that I work with love it and you know, I said to Lori when we're doing the restaurant scene in the neighborhood, I says, Lori, I I, I got this thing in my head can you, can you say it? If you don't want to do it, don't do it. So when she says, I think he likes you, 
you got to say a guy like that will make you happy for a second and, and, and break your heart for a lifetime. This is a question I had. I wasn't sure if I, I should bring it up because I don't want to spoil anything for people planning on seeing the film. But in, in this movie, you meet a woman and in, in the matter of two days, you've you've fallen in love with her you, and you introduce her to your family. You're basically giving her, you know, your safety deposit key, everything that's in your life to her. But it didn't really seem to me, and I could be perceiving this wrong, that she even really felt the same way. I didn't get the impression that she was in love with you. I, I think that both of them, the both characters, when they saw each other for the first time in the restaurant, there was a spark. I think that he didn't expect it because he's, he's just a pig and he's right. a misogynist, narcissistic bag of shit at the, at the beginning of, of the movie and he emancipates. Uh, I, I, but I, I think that, first of all, Lord Fortier's a brilliant actor. She's, oh, she's, she's amazing. She's a very uh, pretty lady too. You know, there's a lot of very good looking actors in the world. True. But her soul is beautiful. I was going to say that next, yes. It was out on camera. That the gravitas mm -hmm. is what makes a, a movie star. Did you guys engage in intercourse in that, in that film, or had you had not even slept with her and the love was just that pure? I, I think that, I, I think that um, she was a good girl, and he's used to just banging anything that he could possibly bang and not give a fuck, right? Right. There was sexual tension between the two mm -hmm. of the characters, but I think that, uh, you know, that's for the audience. To, to see that he and even his mother told him that you know my son's never brought a girl home like fuck. right that's a shocker but uh, you know i love i love uh the neighborhood i think uh Giancarlo Giannini is absolutely spectacular in it i thought he was amazing uh he's from the movie the original uh, 1974 film swept away yes and he was nominated for an oscar for the seven beauties wow see i don't and know that film but yeah yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant movie, and he's also, um, you know, he's in the first two James Bond movies with Daniel Craig. My uh, wife was telling me about that last night, and she was kicking herself that she didn't get a picture with him, but I thought he was amazing. So, Frank, how do you go about, like, you know, I'm, I'm an aspiring filmmaker myself, and I can barely get my stepdad to appear in it. How do you go about getting all of these A-listers? Uh, you send them a script, and if it... it, it it arouses their curiosity, then you negotiate the funds. Right. Now, Giancarlo Giannini, we sent him the script in Italy. He liked it, but he wanted to know who the f wrote it, and he wanted to know who's going to direct the movie. Mm -hmm. So he, he was in New York. He was going to New York uh, for uh, another movie that he's doing, and he said, you know, come to New York. I want to meet you before I commit. So I met him there, and Danny Aiello, uh, I, had not, I had met him in Toronto where he did Moonstruck when I was a kid. So we... Uh, I said wow. Danny, to Danielle, I'm meeting Giancarlo Giannini, and I'm on a Sante for, for uh, dinner. I'd like you to be there. And, uh, and Danny Aiello is another Oscar-nominated actor. Danny Aiello is the greatest human being I've ever met in my life. Hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, we wanted him. I love him. <laughs> and, he just, and he's a great actor. Hmm. Just f***ing amazing. Yeah, he played your father in the film. And uh, yeah, I thought he yeah. was very convincing as well. Uh, just a, a total joy to work with. But I want to go back to that piece of shit at uh, Vanity Fair. And also, the, you know, J Jim, James Conn is a very, very dear friend of mine. Right. James Conn, he wanted to do Sicilian Vampire because he thought the fucking line, give me a little nibble, give me a little bite, was hysterical. Oh, that's one of the best lines in the movie. Just James Conn, with all that dignity, asking for you to give him a little nibble so he can become a vampire to have eternal youth. But, but think about it. But think about it. You would do the same thing. You know, I mean, guys, he's a university professor. He's, a, he's dedicated his whole life mm -hmm. to the study of this. Yeah, he had uh, a PhD in mythology in the film. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, he knows he knows what's going on, right? You know, when, when that article came out in, in Vanity Fair, uh, James Conn was really pissed off. Sorry, can... Can you just give our listeners context so they know? Because I know what you're talking about, but I want the listeners to know what you're referring to. They're refer this, this, this hack, this f***ing retard who eats uh, macaroni and cheese with hot dogs every day waiting to f***ing write a bullshit story, wrote uh, that James Conn uh, took the movie because he's desperate for money. Now, hmm. he gets a ton of offers every day to make movies. He's got money thrown at him all the time. He walked off another project to do Sicilian Vampire. So how the f*** is there any truth in what this f***ing piece of shit wrote? Was there any truth? Was there a seed that they just took and ran with it? Seed of truth? No, no, no. The, the, the seed, if you're, you're talking about how, how uh, bullshit would, would work, is he's going through a brutal divorce. It's going to cost him a fortune. 
Now he's because he's doing a movie, a Canadian movie, and he loved it so much that he didn't do do um, a big project that they asked him to do for a pilot for a major uh, network. He walked. He took us. Wow. So how could there be any f-ing truth? So there's no hard feelings, and you're still friends with James Conn to this day. What do you mean? We, we, we have to sue Vampire. We made another movie. We made the Red Maple Leaf. I just want to clear that up for the people who don't know. I, of course, knew well, that. Well, he made the, the, the Red Maple Leaf. He plays the center. He's brilliant in that movie. His son has a brief appearance in that film, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very good, great mm-hmm. guy. Not his Scott Conn, but his other son, his lesser-known son. Yeah, but Scott, Scott was going to be in the movie, uh, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, um, schedule didn't uh, balance out. And plus, you know, Jimmy, uh, when he did the Red Maple Leaf on his flight to... Toronto to do the movie while he was on the plane, his mother passed away. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So it was, it was really like, it was really horrific. And, uh, so we put him on the plane back to LA the next night. Cause that was the only one that was available. And he, we, we flipped everything around and did the, 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 the closing scene. Mm-hmm. Wow. Of, that must've been stressful. Well, it was, it was, he was very emotional. You know, it doesn't matter how old your parents are when they die. They oh, when course. they die, there's a there's a, a, major, a, a major finality to it, and it kind of makes you kind of makes you mortal. Yeah, exactly. Does Frank D'Angelo vacation? No, never. Never. No. Yeah, I'm gonna lie on a f-ing beach and suntan my balls and f-ing shoot myself. No. <laughs> um. So you're you're obviously insanely busy. Uh, in fact, just this interview, if people haven't been paying attention, has taken me. Five or six tries, I think, to uh, to nail it down. I'm very yeah, but, but, but you know, your timing. Life's timing. Timing is life. Timing is life. That's that's uh, from Sicilian Vampire. Speaking of that timing, all those things. How do you find the time to maintain relationships with? Oh, one quick second. Hang on. Yeah. Well, I apologize that because uh, you know, I people call me twenty four times in this room. They 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 put in a code. So I know it's urgent, so I had to take it. Sorry. Oh, no problem. I, that, that's, what, that's what I was kind of getting to. You're, you're constantly busy. Do you, do you have time to be in a relationship with a female? That's, uh, I don't like my personal life out there, but I'm very, very, very happy personally mm-hmm. in, in, uh, in, in, in relationship. And, and um, you know, I have a great lady in uh, my life, and uh, we've, been, uh, we've been best friends for 15 years, so that's it. Excellent. Do you do you just have one son? Or are you close to your sons? Or I have two sons and a daughter, and uh, we uh, we have a relationship like anybody else. Uh, sometimes we're uh, we're in uh, La La Land, and everybody's frolicking in the meadow, and sometimes uh, we're uh, bitching at each other, just like any normal human being. Right. Well, but we're family, mm-hmm. so that's all that counts. And you're nothing without family. That's a common uh, theme in all of your films, that family is everything. And I was going to ask, how important is money in your life? I don't give a f- about money. Right. Uh, let's not uh, be children here. Without money, uh, it's very difficult mm-hmm. to make a lot of things happen. It's very difficult to, uh, to exist because that's the way we exist. But uh, money is not uh, the fundamental reason that drives any of my projects or any of my dreams. I, I wasn't in music for money. For f- you starve to death, especially now because yeah. everybody rips it off. So let's say all of your money got taken away from you. Are you such a crafty businessman you'd just be able to get back on your feet? You know, there's a great line in my song, and it's a, probably a line that uh, was instilled. That, Give me a good pair of shoes of my health, and I will conquer the f***ing world. Wow. So They say f***ing. <laughs> I don't say in the song, oh, okay. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but it's, um, you know, I've, I've taken the elevator to the penthouse and I've taken to the, uh, the elevator to the basement okay. and I've taken the elevator to the, ba- uh, uh, up and down and probably down to the basement more times than up. Is this a metaphor? No, no it's things have happened oh. in, in, you know, I've been successful. I've, I've, I've had issues, you know, I'm, I'm, anytime you're an entrepreneur, you are susceptible to the, economic climate change. Right. So when the interest rates went through the f- roof in, in 1999, I got hurt. You know, shit happens. But, uh, you know, everybody gets hurt. So I really, money has never been, if I was to lose every single thing 
financially and money wise. I would take a deep breath and and uh, throw all that shit in the recycle bin and start fresh uh, on Monday. You seem to be uh, very big on recycling. Is, is that something that's important to you, like the the, the planet? I am a, a clean freak, and if you recycle, it's better for your neighborhood and for your uh, city and for your f-ing province, if you're Canadian and Canada, mm-hmm. because you have less dumps. Wow. You know, and some some of these high tech uh, morons are thinking of a. Uh, putting it into these massive containers and shooting it out into space. What, what is your thought on uh, space pollution? Like shooting it into Mars, let's say. I, I think, you know, if, you, if you're a dirty f-ing person, you're going to get a virus or you're going to get an infection and die. Well said. And my analogy to you is the same thing. If the planet is dirty, we're all going to get an infection and we're all going to die. And I've experienced climate change in Toronto. When I grew up in Toronto... There was snow. There's no more snow. What is it, snow? A couple of f-ing times? My shovel is covered in dust. Yeah, like, there's, there, yeah, yeah. But, you know, so it snows a couple of times. Everybody bitches and complains, but there's no f-ing snow. Anyways. Well, speaking of the planet and the environment, Max Kerman is a resident of planet Earth, and he's a singer in the Arkells. And the last question that he asked me to ask you is what advice would you give him to make it in the music industry? I'm, I'm not familiar with his stuff, but if he's good... He's won f- and, uh, four and, Junos. Yeah, so if he's good and um, he's true to his art, he he will go viral. You know, the, it's very unfortunate that it's very, very, very tough to make it in Canada. Unless you're Drake or Bieber, who I think have made a lot of uh, headway in changing the perception of Canada. Uh, yeah, but Bieber, Bieber, Bieber is an anomaly. You know, he's, his mother just pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. He went viral, right? Mm-hmm. And then he got some great songwriters to write for him, and he became a, he became a phenom, right? right. But uh, your, your guy, uh, if he's true to his passion and he keeps pushing and... You know, he's got to get his music out there. He's got to get his music in movies. Would you ever put one of his songs in one of your films? If it makes sense, why not? Okay. Just because I've noticed you've only used your own music in your own films. Well, let me give you an analogy, my friend. Yes. If you own a f***ing restaurant and you're the cook, you're going to cook your own food. You're not in your restaurant going to go to the other restaurant across the street and get their food and serve it in your restaurant. You wouldn't use Max's song unless it was just perfect for your film. No, I, that's not what I said. I said if it made sense. It okay. doesn't have to be just perfect. I, I don't have to put a very strict and stringent criteria. There's some music in my movie that's not my music. You know, we we have Caruso in a couple of uh, couple of tracks. David Caruso? Enrico Caruso from 1896 uh, or 1899. See, I like music from the 90s, but not the 1890s. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the 90s. But oh, right. no? So your your buddy is rock rock and uh, rock music. Yeah, he has uh, a couple of his videos have over a million views, and I recommend you check out this song. It's called because um, your next movie is about lawyers, and lawyers are kind of like I'm the boss type of attitude. And he has a song called "Boss Is Coming," which is very uh, fitting uh, for it's a cinematic song. Well, I'd like to. Uh, we'll have lunch, the three of us, and we'll talk. Will we though? Because I find you hard to get a hold of. Well, I'm telling you right now. I told you I'd do your show, and I right. also uh, invited you to come down last night. So yeah, th- that's true. And like you saying, take it for what it is, my friend, not for what it's not. Yeah, you gave me your word of honor, and you uh, you were true to that. So was this interview as bad as you thought it might be? No, and and I would not allow it to be bad because right. I would just told you to f- off if you were obnoxious in the first thirty seconds. You know what we talked about? Remember how we use c- sucker in an affectionate way or a derogatory? Of course. Get the f*** out of here, you f- sucker. That's the fraction. And then the bad one is, fuck you, f- sucker. That's bad. I'm learning here. So yeah, No, you're a very bright guy. And uh, hopefully uh, your document. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a documentary. Um, one, of our, one of our most successful shows was I went to cover the inauguration in, in Washington. I saw that. I've seen every episode of the Being Frank show. I saw that episode. And it was being so surreal. And we're walking up this street, and it's quiet. Dead. You can you can hear a mouse fart. <laughs> you know I like that line. Yeah. In the distance, you hear. What the f- is going on, guys? Let's let's just follow this, and we end up being in the middle of about twenty thousand protesters saying "fuck Trump." Wow. 
I have never seen that in my life. I was there when Barack Obama was inaugurated. I'm just just curious. It was, it was like a love fest. So people weren't yelling F- Obama. No way. In fact, there was thousands and thousands of people crying. Uh, white, black, uh, Asian, every 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 human species that exists, and they were crying because it was the last day that Barack Obama was president of the United States of America. Mm-hmm. But I think Barack Obama truly loved this country. Yeah. So that that's the difference between, I would say, Trump and Obama. Yeah, it seems like people don't like, uh, not to get too political here, but it seems like people don't like Trump as much as they liked Obama. Well, anyways, I, it's, I don't give a f- about politics, really. And, and I, you know, I, my view about uh, Donald Trump is not about the, from the news media. I don't care what the news media mm-hmm. writes about him. My view about Donald Trump is just the way I see him and the way I hear what he says. He's a liar. That's a, oh, oh, Of course. Yeah, I've never seen anybody lie like that. But he's not just a liar, my friend. Mm-hmm. He's a fucking blatant liar. Right. Blatant. Would you say so, Trump's a sucker? Um, you know what? I'm not. He's a president of the United States, so I'm going to use a little decorum and I'm going to have a little respect. But I am shocked uh, uh, that this gentleman is in the White House. In your special, I was a little surprised because. A lot of people, when they interview people on the street, they kind of put their opinions in the forefront. They do leading questions. You were equally as respectful to people who liked Trump as people who did not like him. And I found well, that very interesting. I, I, I hate interviewers who ask a question but don't really want to ask a question because they want their specific answer. You know, there's an old Sicilian saying, voice of the people, voice of God. Okay, let me ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Do you believe... What Hillary Clinton was accused of is as nefarious and unlawful as what the allegation against the president of the United States is right now. You're referring to her emails? She was accused of her emails and some corruption with the Clinton Foundation. Those were the allegations, right? Right. No, I don't think she was doing anything as nefarious as Trump was doing. No. Would you say that it's... 90% 90% worse what Trump is being accused of, obstruction of justice. Uh, 90 to 95, yeah. Yeah, yeah. some people who are real uh, great experts are saying that treason should be in there if they catch that he lied and he was doing business with the Russians when there was an embargo. Mm-hmm. See, I don't really follow politics that much. You, you're much more well-versed on it than I am. I'm kind of, uh, I like cartoons and uh, movies. I love cartoons. But anyways... I want to thank you for taking this time to speaking to me. It was an honor uh, to uh, be on your great show. It was an and honor I, to have you. Honestly, uh, our fans are, have really been looking forward to this. Well, hopefully you don't cut this interview and chop it into pieces and, and make it sound like it's not supposed to sound. Well, I don't think we could do that if we tried. That's very kind. So I'll be looking forward to having lunch with you and your four-time Juno Award-winning friend who i believe will be successful boss is coming i want you to look up that song what's it called again boss like b-o-s-s is coming yeah the boss is coming just like uh, bruce springsteen's coming exactly who's one of max's idols yeah i love bruce springsteen love him could you close and just uh, on a funny note just call say shane you're a no i can't do that because i don't know you well enough to be that affectionate towards you or to to uh, be uh, that aggressive with you. But I'll say to you, Shane, it was a surprisingly pleasant interview that I had with you today. And I hope that after I hear this interview, I don't have to call you and say, you f***ing <laughs> suck. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right, Shane. So here's the close of the episode, but this has really been the Shaney Boy Show today. So, Shane, close us out. All right. So, uh, you know, don't forget to share the pod and rate us on iTunes and uh, like us on Instagram. And, you know, I'll see you next weekend if I don't get whacked on the weekend. (laughs) 